Right. Now, we're going to do something fun because this is something we've been going and really pulling out some material that's been uh, uh, great groundbreaking and exciting. We're going to kind of go back and put our feet up and put, throw some things out there that you may not agree with. We're not even sure if we agree with, but this is new research done by A.J. Dius, a good friend of Mel's. I don't know him myself. I've only seen some of his material. I see he's from Europe and he has been doing some amazing research. And this is part of his research, looking at possible candidates for who these Muhammads are. Remember in the last episode, we said that there were a number of Muhammads between six uh, 641 and 730, that roughly 100 year period, 90 to 100 year period, that the, both John of Damascus and the Chinese are referring to. So, who are these Muhammads? What are they? Are they really real people? Are they uh, are they uh, people that we cannot recognize? Let's see what AJ Dios, and I'm going to have Mel, you're the one that knows this material. You've been working with him. Uh, let's see what he comes up with. Over to you. Okay, so I'm just going to share uh, the slides before. Before we get started and right so this is really a kind of a speculation it's ed educated guesses let's say by aj juice so it should be a bit of fun as i say um but he go makes an attempt at identifying some of these mahmeds or muhammads as it were so one of them that he points to is marzutra the second who is the 30th jewish exilarch now if, if you're not sure what an exilarch was it's essentially the jewish leader of the diaspora where you know the jews were spread all over the the known world he was their main leader he died about 520 and after he was killed his his body was suspended from a cross on the bridge at Mahosa um, and the reason for that was he took up arms against the Persians and organized an uprising to um, to oppose the introduction of communism um, so he's obviously a significant ex -lark. it's not too often that ex are essentially crucified I don't know if he was actually crucified or just his body hung up on a cross afterwards but in any case what's interesting is three years later there is an inscription referring to a Mahmed. Um here it's translated as uh by the lord of jews by the highly praised with the word is Mahmed, um which would suggest that they were the jews were viewing marzutra the second as um a messiah figure why because he he did what the messiah was meant to do which is rebel and you know take up arms against the powers that be you know fortunately he died but they they viewed him as a messiah it would seem at least in terms of the the timing now um so aj juice goes on to say that um he believes that there were a number of others like that who he thinks were part of this chain of Mahmeds. One of them is um, the Marzutra. Now, there's a, a family tree called the Marzutrans springing from that previous one that we just mentioned, Marzutra. And he was Nehemiah bin Huziel. And that was the guy who was the leader who failed to hold on to the Temple Mount in 617. Okay, so you can see that in the, the diagram to the right. So, very important event was the conquest of Jerusalem by this Jewish leader, the, the Exilarch. And his brother is significant. His brother was Salmon. Um, so we can see down uh, at the bottom there that um, you have the two brothers, Nehemiah and uh, Shalom. Okay. Now, Shalom may not mean anything to you, but um, it is actually very similar to Salmon al Farsi, which you find in the standard Islamic narrative, who was an associate of Muhammad. But here in the actual historical record, we have an exilarch associated with the conquest of Jerusalem, who the Jews would have probably considered another Messiah. So it's part of a chain of Messiahs. And his close uh, associate, his brother actually, became the next exilarch. So he took over. Um, so this is from a a Jewish paper and the the uh, the writer is Abramson and he believes that Salman Farsi is based on this Jewish exilarch. So it's not just AJ Juice who thinks that. So it's just two people um, who believes that, right? So um, AJ Juice also speculates that Yaakov, um, which is Yaakov of Syria, who was another claimant to the 
the role of Exilarch, that he is Abu Bakr. Okay. Um, again, this may not or may not be true. It's just a, a speculation here. Um, he was um, someone who was at the Academy of Pompadita in Baghdad. Okay, and he's mentioned as Jacob in the Doctrina Jacobi. So AJ Juice is putting two and two together to come up with this idea. Um, another one he proposes is Salman al Farsi, who he says is Uthman, based on um, just in terms of the timing and his place. I, I disagree with him on that one. I think I have a better suggestion for who Uthman is based on. And to do that, I look at the Byzantine Arabic Chronicle. It doesn't refer to Uthman there, it refers to Etaman. And if you break down that word Etaman, it's actually a composite of uh, E.T. and He-Man. There was an Exilarch, let me just go back a second. You, uh, let me see if it's in here. It's uh, down at the, the left-hand side of this diagram here, you'll see He-Man the first, the 38 Exilarch, um, which his um, time when he reigned is in the right time frame for Uthman. So my suggestion, I'm going against AJ Juice, again, it's speculation, is that perhaps um, Etman, uh, Etman that's mentioned here is actually He-Man, just the name is just transformed a little bit. And then it became from Etman to Uthman later. Um, I've, I've even gone a little bit further and suggested that perhaps the ET is re reference to the fact that he was an Exilarch Temporalis, a temporary Exilarch, and that's where it came from. So as I say, this is just a bit of fun, a bit of speculation, but that might work in terms of trying to make sense for where they got these characters from. But it's very different to the standard Islamic narrative because these are just Jewish leaders. It's got nothing to do with Islam. Um, and so uh, AJ Juice um, refers to He-Man in his paper, and he identifies him with Abdullah ibn Saba, the builder of the first permanent mosque, the Masjid as Salam on the Temple Mount. Um, he is also, according to Jews, Abdul Allah ibn al Zubair, uh, another Muhammad. Um, as I say, I, I don't think he was that figure, but that again, it, it opens up the possibility at least there. Um, so AJ Juice goes on to say that. The Marzutra lineage carries the title of Muhammad with Proto-Islam. Marzutra II was Muhammad, therefore Nehemiah bin Huziel was Muhammad, therefore his brother Salman al-Farisi was Muhammad, and so on. So that's his idea. Um, he also uh, mentions his day the second, the fourth exilarch, as another uh, possible Muhammad. So we have a chain of them. Um, he also refers to Bostone, who... Um, his, his family were considered unclean because they married into the, um, the, the Persian family line. Uh, and so he's referred to as unclean as a result of that. Um, so this is a summary here of the chain of Muhammad's. These are just some that AJ Juice suggests are Muhammad's. Um, and so that's it, Jay. I'll just go back to you there. So basically what you're saying and i'll just so people follow you here because you're putting an awful lot of information but this is good information this is what aj deus is saying let me just go through it real quickly in summary so marzutra that you say is probably the of of the name the number of uh muhammad's it could be he would put him down as the first one he died in five five twenty so that's a sixth century then we come into the seventh century and we come with nehemiah the second which you have there ben hushiel and he died possibly 614 to, or 617. We're not really sure of that date. But now we're in the 7th century. And then you go to Hanamel, who is also known as Shalom, that A.J. Deus believes is Uthman. You say probably Heman the first. that's Ethaman, which is very close to Uthman. I would probably go with you on this. Uh, I would agree with you. This is probably the Uthman that the standard Islamic narrative has grabbed. And then after him comes Yaqub of Syria, who dies in 643, and that this is the same person as Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr that the, the Saturn Islamic narrative uh, uh, demands or puts as their first caliph. And then finally, Heman the first. 
And he's Abdullah ibn Mithaba, who you would say is Ibn Zubair, who created or caused the problem with this, uh, the Civil War. So what you're saying is we can actually identify quite a few of these people who then are then grabbed by the standard Islamic narrative and made into caliphs. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali. Ali is, of course, another one that would be. But we've never been able to find the term Uthman yet. It looks like you may be right. Maybe that's Ethaman, uh, who would be him on the first. These are all exilarchs. These are all Jews. These are all living in uh, in in uh, way over in Pambadita, which is again real close to what is today Baghdad, just south of Baghdad. That could be what's going on here. So they are taking real people that are historical, that were heads of the Jewish community, who were looking for the Messiah, who would have referred to these people as the Muhammad, the praised one, the altogether lovely. It could stand to reason. I would agree with you. If these are Jewish kings or Jewish authorities who would be given that title as Muhammad, then it could be very well that that's why then the title isn't grabbed by the Arabs because they are all already, that title's been used by the Christians, that title's been used by the Jews. If they're using that title for the praise one for their authority, then can you then understand, you Jews are waiting for him. We've got him. His name is Uthman. We've got the Uthman. Can you then understand why he became the prophet because of the of what was happening on the ground. And we've always said, have we not, that you need to go what's happening on the ground. If this is what's happening in the 7th and 8th century, and it started way back in 520 in the 6th century, then why are we surprised that they're grabbing the name that would have already been used by the Jews and Christians to give uh, authority to their Jesus, their Messiah that's just to come, they're kind of killing two birds with one stone. Folks, we've got both what your Jews and your Christians are waiting for. We've got the, the Muhammad. Uh, he is the great Aziz. He is also the MHFB, uh, Muhammad of Hebrew. Uh, but he's also the one that Ambrose uh, designated in the fourth century for Jesus Christ. Come on home is what they're saying. We've got the Muhammad. You're Great stuff. I like this because this really leads in. You're right. You put this out as a speculation, but I'm saying, hold on a minute. This may help us understand why did they choose this name? Because this is a question that always comes up. Why did the Arabs or why did the ones who be, who finally created this sect called Islam, why did they choose this man and why did they choose that name? I would suggest A.J. Deuce is onto something here. You choose that which everybody's waiting for. You choose that which everybody has respect for. You choose that which both Jesus and the Messiah that the Jews are waiting for has already been named. And you take that name and you then appropriate it for yourself. He then becomes the fulfillment of what everybody's waiting for as not only a political gesture, but this would be a theological gesture as well. Okay. Fantastic. What are we doing next? Now we're going to go through some change. Well, we're going to go to um, star witness Benjamin of Tudela. Okay. Yeah. Folks, see what you think. <laughs> is AJ Deuce onto something here? I think he is. I think this is really an exciting one because this suddenly answers the question that many people are saying then why did they choose Muhammad? Why did they give him that name? Why was that name given to him? And why is it from, from that time on? Muhammad is the man we look as the greatest of all paradigms, the greatest of all models. Well, who do you think the the Arabs need? They need a model. They need a prophet who has a revelation that can compete with that which the Jews and the Christians are still waiting for. We're still waiting for the Messiah to relate return. The Jews are still for, waiting for the Messiah to even come. And what they're pretty much saying is he's already here. This is him. And he is the final, the greatest. Now we can understand why they call, claim him the greatest. Now we can understand why he is the final. He is the final one. They're basically saying we've got it, is what they're saying. And we've got him because he's the man you're looking for. Good stuff. All that has been destroyed, though. Isn't that interesting? All these references to the Muhammads that we're looking for has been destroyed. And I want to thank A.J. Dews for maybe uncovering it by looking at other documents that exist from that time period and by other names of people like the Exilarchs who would have carried that mantle uh, at that time. Good stuff. All right. This is going to be, we're going to be back again with our final episode uh, looking at the Benjamin of Toluda to look for evidence yet again. We're looking for that evidence. Until next time, this is Mel and Jay. Over and out.